For today's In Focus, we return to the capital of the United Kingdom, London, and in turn the British Museum, for it is here that one of my favourite artefacts is on display to the public. As promised a little while ago on the Archaeosoup Facebook page, today we are taking a look at Frank's casket. This beautiful artefact is 22.9 centimetres long, 19 centimetres wide, and 10.9 centimetres high. It is an intricately carved casket, much like a reliquary, and from its artistic style, along with the Old English inscribed upon it, is thought to come from the northeast of England in the first half of the 8th century AD. By the 18th century, it had made its way to the church of Saint-Julien in Brioude, France. It is thought to have been looted from the church during the French Revolution and made its way into the possession of a family in the village of Ouzon in the south of France. Whilst here, it adopted a prosaic provincial lifestyle. It became a sewing box, housing needle and thread. That is, until the silver hinges and fittings, as seen on a similar casket here, were removed and traded for a silver ring. The casket, now just a collection of panels, were shown to a local professor, who in turn sold them to an antique shop in Paris. It was here in 1857 that Englishman Sir Augustus Wollaston Franks purchased the panels and eventually donated them to the British Museum. Meanwhile, a seemingly missing panel from the box, the right end, was found in a desk drawer by the family in Ouzon. This was sold to the Bargello Museum in Florence, where it was identified as part of the casket in 1890. Today, the so-called Frank's casket in London includes a casting of the once-missing right-end piece. And so today it sits in the British Museum for all to see. Now, let's take a closer look. Strictly speaking, all that remains of the lid is the centre section. Originally, above and below, there may have been carvings or silver relief work. In the centre is an area for a silver boss, or possibly a handle. The carving shows a scene of an archer, labelled in runes, Egil, single-handedly defending a fortress from a troop of attackers, who may even be giants. Within the fortress is a lady, possibly his wife or lover. According to Norse mythology, Egil was the husband of the swan maiden, Olren. Egil is also the brother of Wayland, who is shown on the front panel of the casket. Wayland stands at the extreme left of the panel, near the forge, where he is held as a slave by King Neithad. According to myth, the grim hero Wayland was captured by the king and forced to work as a smithy. In revenge, he killed the king's sons, made goblets from their skulls, and attacked the king's daughter when she brought a ring that needed fixing. On the left-hand side of the panel, the story plays out, and eventually Wayland escapes on the wings of a swan. In stark contrast, the right-hand side of the panel depicts an altogether more familiar and less grim scene. We are shown the adoration of the Magi, or wise men, who came to visit the Madonna and Child in the Bible. The three wise men have indeed been led by a star, and rather pleasingly, above their heads, a runic inscription identifies them. For all to see, they are labelled as the M-A-G-I, the Magi. But these aren't the only runes to be seen. Around the entire front panel runs a runic inscription, which is a riddle on the origins of the casket itself. The fish beat up the seas, onto the mountainous cliff. The king of terror became sad when he swam onto the shingle. Any ideas? The answer is a whale. Frank's casket is carved from the bones of a whale, which had become beached. Next we move on to the left end panel of the casket, which depicts another famous mythical scene. Here we see the twin founders of Rome, Romulus and Remus, being suckled by a she-wolf and around the panel the runes read, Far from home, Romulus and Remus, twain brothers, the she-wolf fed them in Rome. And there, at the bottom of the panel, we see the wolf lying on her back, suckling the twins and protecting them from harm. Next, on the rear panel, we see the taking of Jerusalem by Titus in the First Jewish-Roman War. Around the edge of the panel, the runes read, Here fight Titus and the Jews, here the inhabitants of Jerusalem flee, doom, hostage. In the year 70 AD, Titus famously besieged Jerusalem, depicted here in Rome. Interestingly, not only is this panel dramatic, but on the top right there is a departure from runes showing Latin script and letters. And finally, we come to the right end piece of the casket, 
that which was lost for a while. The meaning of this panel is not entirely clear. There are many divergent readings, both in the text and the images. Interpretations range from the burial of Sigurd, an instruction on how to die well as a hero, to another depiction of the Nativity of Christ, with three wise men stood on the right of the panel. What cannot be denied is that this scene, whatever it means, has once again been beautifully carved upon the whalebone. Indeed, the whole casket is a magnificent piece of craftsmanship. An artefact as intriguing in its appearance as it is dramatic in its themes. It has been suggested by some that these panels were meant to bring to mind different stages in life. Birth, nurturing, war, death, tribulation, glory. And that perhaps these stages reflect the life of an early Saxon king. Others have been drawn to the runes and dots inscribed upon the casket and have constructed elaborate mathematical treaties as to how this was an object infused with ancient magic. They point to the ancient belief in the power of runes and the written word and infer a fusion of ancient magic and rituals with the new religion of Christianity. Debate will continue. But if nothing else, this casket speaks of a competent and vibrant culture, aware of history and their place in the world. The Saxons who settled in 8th century Northumbria wanted to emulate and surpass history. Indeed, it was in the northeast, in Newcastle upon Tyne's Great North Museum, the Hancock, that I first came across a copy of Frank's casket. This is a proud object for a proud part of the world, and one of my all-time favourite artefacts. <laughs>